session we are going to hear about properties from the past. The first talk is going to be presented by Ben Lickmeyer, who is going to tell us about some really nifty type level techniques used in the new version of the Repo Library. All right, thank you. Hello. Yes, uh, guiding parallel ray fusion with index types, aka Repo version 3. <laughs> <laughs> so, REPA, if you haven't seen it before, supports flat data parallelism. Uh, here's some example applications. We have uh, matrix relaxation, uh, image processing like edge detection, um, FFT, also fluid simulation. These are flat, regular programs with lots of data. You apply the same function to every pixel to get the result. Um, because we have lots of data, it's easy to distribute, and it's flat because the computation which evaluates each pixel is sequential, so it's not nested parallelism. Uh, if you want nested parallelism, you have to go to the edge. There's some other examples, so we can have a, a fractal program, ray tracing, and then uh, volumetric interpolation, which I'll talk about later on. These are also flat parallel programs, but in this case they're unbalanced because computation of some pixels takes longer than the computation of the others. So REPA, uh, these are types from REPA version 2, the previous version, um, support some useful looking functions. So the usual things over arrays, um, you've got folds, you've got uh, general traversal. Um, it's also shape polymorphic, meaning it supports uh, arrays of arbitrary dimensions, like so dimension 1 vectors, or dimension 2 images, or cubes, or up, upwards. So it looks really... Uh, well, Rapid 2 looked really cool, and then of course people tried to use it. <laughs> and then, given the, the functions I showed you, you might try and write this program. So it's fairly straightforward. You add, add the elements of two arrays and then multiply those by two. Uh, unfortunately, that program is about 100 times slower than data vector, which is a bit <laughs> unsatisfying. Uh, and, I, and I got email, <laughs> and I got complaints. Uh, the problem is that. You have to know how it works to use it. So, REPA uh, there's, supports two sorts of arrays. Manifest arrays, which are real data elements in memory, usually in unboxed uh, data vectors. And it also has delayed arrays. And a delayed array isn't real data, it's really a function which takes an uh, index, which is, takes an index of the element that you want and gives the element value. So there's, REPA arrays exist in these two different modes, real elements and then uh, element producing functions. If you want your program to run at a sensible speed, you have to use this force function. What a force function does is it takes the delay array and then computes the, the manifest one. So REPA does um, array fusion and it does fusion via these delayed arrays. <coughs> For instance, zip width produces not a real manifest array, but a delayed array. So the result of this is a function which will compute every element when it's demanded. And then the definition of map takes this function and then uh, composes it with times two. And then the result of all of this is also a delayed array. So it computes elements on demand. If you actually want an actual, honest to goodness, real array in memory, you have to call force. And if you don't, um, your program runs really slow. So that's what I said. So if we were to make the program actually work, we have to add that. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, the, the, the type of force doesn't reveal how important it is. Force looks like an uh, instance of identity function. So in, in the package page, in the documentation, it said force converts a delayed array to a manifest array. People just overlooked it. The program's on really slow. I got email. <laughs> uh, so another thing is that even though when you finally add force, the program runs at a reasonable speed, but it doesn't run as fast as it possibly can. Uh, you have to add a little, little, little tweaks. Um, with this program, I remember I said arrays can be delayed or manifest. Because double zip takes two arrays, 
when it compiles, when GDC compiles the program, it has to worry about every combination of whether the first array is delayed, the second array is delayed, the first array is manifest, the second array is delayed, and, and so on. So with the case-to-case -case transform, when you compile the program, you end up with four different uh, versions of the loop which handle every combination, so you can get code explosion. Um, to fix that, what I recommended is to add this manifest pattern, which just cuts off the, the... If you expect the arrays that you pass into the manifest, you add extra patterns. And then, due to some details in the GHC simplifier, if you want it to run even faster, you have to add these weird veins on empty arguments for a reason I won't go into. And then this is the actual program which um, I put the graphs for in my paper. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this, this runs fine, but it's really ugly and it's not obvious what's going on. So REPA3 solves this problem. So we have a, our arrays now have a new type argument, which is a type index which will describe what representation I'm really talking about. Um, yeah, right there. For instance, now, when you have a delayed array, I have a defined type index D, and I use data families to say that uh, when I have a delayed array, I have a D as the, as the uh, representation tag. And when I have a, a manifest array, for an unboxed manifest array, I use a, a type index U and, and have a U here. Okay? So now the, the array type reveals what's actually inside it. And with this, technique, I can give a much more sensible type to force. Force now takes a delayed array and produces an unboxed array. See what's going on. Uh, turns out force wasn't the best um, name for this function either because people ask, why is my program so slow? Because you haven't forced it. But the consumer is strict. It's like, doesn't it force automatically? It's like, don't have to use the force function. <laughs> I should have called it compute speed, so we don't have it as well. Uh, there's also now a compute S, so you can use a compute inside a compute and not have nested parallelism. Of course, why, when we have this wonderful uh, general technique, why stop with just delayed array and manifest arrays? We also have uh, now manifest byte arrays, so you can store your, your words in a byte array, you can store your words in a, a foreign memory buffer, which is really helpful if you want to uh, construct an array directly into a foreign buffer without having to put it in the Haskell heap and then copy it out afterwards. Um, last year I also, or well, when in Repo 2, it supports uh, these things called cursive arrays and partitioned arrays, which uh, are good for expressing stencil convolutions, which are um, ubiquitous image, image processing. Uh, I won't go into this in too much detail, but a stencil convolution. Uh, image processing is defined with this thing called a stencil kernel, which you uh, sort of apply to every every element in the array to get the result pixels. When you want to write fast code, you have to worry about the case when your little stencil is outside, or some of the elements are outside the, the buffer. So in this, this yellow region, um, you really want to use a different function in that region which handles the border case, where when you're computing elements in the internal part, all your, all your stencil is inside this array, so you don't have to worry about the order case. So it's helpful if you can define these sorts of functions using uh, different Haskell functions to uh, define the elements of different regions in the array. So with our uh, new representation tags, this is really easy to express. So here's an array with array, uh, this should, should be D2 for a two-dimensional array with its elements. But you can see what's going on here. You can say this uh, array has been partitioned into one, two, three, four, five partitions, where the middle one uses this uh, fast cursive representation, and then the, the edges uses uh, regular delayed arrays. So you can see the, the structure of the computation that you're going to get from the representation table. Okay. Uh, so, of course, if you have all these different representations, we need to um, make this more, more polymorphic because compute P, the type I showed before, only works on uh, delayed and unboxed. So there's some type classes. Uh, the type classes we have are load and target. Uh, and I'm going to build this up from another auxiliary type class called source. 
So source is the, the class of array representations which I can read elements from, and they have a, a function which takes the shape of the array and indexes into it. Um, and I might just skip over that because I'm running out of time. There's also a, a target class. This is the class of things which can use, be used as targets. So un mutable unbox vectors and foreign buffers are instances of targets. Uh, and this contains a, a function to generate a new mutable array to write elements into it, and when you're done, freeze it into a, a real vector array. And using these two type classes, we produce this load class. So what a load does is uh, either in parallel or sequentially uh, read all the elements from this array or, com or compute all the elements of this array if the representation is delayed and then write them into this mutable vector. Okay, so there's just these three classes which uh, color, well, wrangle all the different representations. Using those classes, you can write a nice uh, definition, most polymorphic definition of compute. And provided your favorite array representation has uh, an instance for either load or target or both, then you can have a parallel array computation in your favorite representation. Uh, I'll say something just quickly. So here's some. Uh, Practical details. Here's the, the crossword array, uh, sorry, the, the image processing example I had before with my arrays partitioned into five components. So here's an example application you might do with that. So um, this, this application uh, computes the Laplace transform on um, these initial conditions, and then after a thousand steps, you get that. So it uses this uh, partitioned. Uh, partition representation to optimize handling of the, the edge cases. Turns out that if you run that uh, directly, you get a thread scope plot like this. So hopefully most people have seen thread scope, but up the top we have the <coughs> cumulative uh, activity for eight cores, and each of these lines are the activity for each, each core. And what you notice here is that the activity is broken up into this big section, which is the the computation for the inner part of the array, which takes the most amount of time, and then we have one, two, three, four bursts of activity where I compute each of the borders. Now I can see a problem with this is that uh, even though I said I wanted to optimize the handling of the border case, the, the border cases, because they're only computing a fine strip around the edge of the array, they take so little amount of time that scheduling overheads dominate the, the runtime. So for most of the time, the, the machine is blocked waiting for MVARS to, to wake up and operating system threads to be scheduled. But I can fix this using my uh, representation tags. So what I'm going to do now is define a new representation, uh, a meta representation. So SR is the, the representation of uh, arrays where computation of that, those elements is a small amount of work. So I'll define a new uh, array type, and I'm going to use this auxiliary type definition, where I have the same partitioning structure, but in this I set the borders in the type system to tell it that computation of each border is only a small amount of work. And then in my load instance, all I have to do is point the load in parallel function to the load sequential function, and then now it knows not to bother sparking off a thread for each border. So here's the new thread scope plot. It's still a big, big burst of work for the, um, the main part, but there's no uh, crap in the middle. It just runs the, it evaluates the borders in the, in the main thread. Now there's still a big gap between here which I'm going to have to have a conversation about with some model about. Uh, but notice that this is only uh, 200 microseconds. So we're talking about scheduling of operating system threads, which, which takes its time. Um, another uh, example, so this is an example of a three-dimensional interpolator for MRI data, written by a guy, Michael Olitsky. And he wrote this for part of his PhD, no, his master's degree in math 
He wrote it in Rep 2, and then I helped him optimize it using the techniques from Rep 3. Um, something about this um, uh, example is that it's an unbalanced workload because, so maybe we'll back up. Uh, interpolation means he's a zoomed in, this is a zoomed in section of a, the top part of the brain, and he's the interpolated part. To compute the result where there's actual uh, tissue here, takes more work than to compute the interpolation where there's air. Um, here's the thread scope plot where I've divided up the, the workload just by assigning um, chunks to each thread. So the first thread gets the, the first part of the array and the second thread gets the next part of the array. And you can see that the, the threads two and three, that they're computing this middle part of the array, so they, they have more work to do. And because of that, my workload becomes unbalanced. So this is the some possible evaluation orders you might not, might like to use when uh, computing arrays. Uh, chunk is what I was using. Uh, turns out my my tensor functions actually is column wise, but for this application because it's uh, so unbalanced, I prefer to use this interleaved uh, method where I get every thread to compute alternate uh, pixels. So on average. Each thread will be given the same, about the same amount of work. Um, so once again, using the, the wonder of representation tags, this is really easy to add. I define a new representation which says this is the, an ar array representation where um, the inner representation represents an unbalanced workload. Um, and then once again, I define a new load instance which uh, the load function shells out to a, a special purpose uh, loop which um, evaluates uh, interleaving uh, pixels. So it interleaves the work between the threads. So I is for interleaved. Interleaved is the evaluation method, and I use interleaved evaluation for unbalanced workloads. So here's a type for my interpolation function, showing that it takes an unboxed cube of data and produces a an unbalanced computation. That's the old uh, thread scope plot, and here's a new one. See, it's all now. Okay. Last example um, for the eye candy. <laughs> array tracers are also an unbalanced workload. So you have real time ray tracing running in Haskell, in a real Haskell program, um, using, can't actually see, but uh, on the four threads of my Mac Air. And you can scroll around. <laughs> 